Hello everyone, today we talk about the composition and the numerical strength of the Neo-Assyrian armies. So, recently I began to talk on, on Schwerpunkt also about um, the Assyrian armies looking a bit back compared to our um, usual timeline. As I, I've always been fascinated by the Assyrians and um, although I, I didn't know uh, a big deal about them up to now, you have to think that these uh, videos are also a way for me to repeat actually things that I read um, and to, to understand them better and to um, uh, comment them uh, essentially uh, also just speaking about them is different from just thinking about them so <laughs> I, I decided to I decided to, to make you uh, to participate to, to the process well no I'm kidding of course um, this is just our usual talk about military history and I think this is an interesting topic as um, what we know about the Assyrian armies is not this huge much. Most of our evidence um, is based on um, e iconographic sources from mo Assyrian monuments um, and, um, and we have for the rest pretty generally scanty evidence. I mean the Assyrians also compared to, to other peoples out there at the time are obviously better documented in obviously in relative terms. However, uh, um, our sources are still pretty um, pretty rare complexively given also the, the time uh, and importance of the Assyrian Empire and um, are also relatively difficult to interpret. Uh, for some things just like equipment we are relatively well documented, given that we have extensive iconographic evidence. Uh, when we get, in fact, to the or organizational point of view and just trying to understand how many troops and in, in which proportion, in which ratio, actually, uh, like we will see today, um, were the uh, the Assyrian armies made of, hmm, it's, it starts uh, to 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 be a bit difficult. So um, there is actually a lot written about uh, these topics so that you can understand it's um, it's one of those topics in history that you can cover broadly mm. on Schwerpunkt we mostly talk about medieval history and no person in the world can have read all the medieval sources mm -hmm. while you can read the Assyrian source you can uh, learn let's say about the, uh, um, the Assyrian sources um, <coughs> in a lifetime definitely and also becoming a an expert on it so there have been, been people who have already done this. Um, I um, have to uh, advise you um, the work of, um, I'm sorry if I m mispronounce the name, um, from Tamas Dezzo, mm -hmm. who wrote um, a series of books on the, uh, on the Assyrian army um, at the Eötvös um, Lorand University. Um, and uh, it, it's um, it's an amazing uh, work, telling the truth. I have only the first book about the Syrian um, the Syrian infantry, mm -hmm. and uh, this uh, this is evidently I think an Hungarian um, author. <coughs> so if you are interested, it's extremely extreme. He uh, he wrote an extremely precise and, and spot on work. So I just thought it was fair to advise it to you and if you read <laughs> his work you you realize how much my videos uh, suck also in, <laughs> in terms of quality of um, you know of analysis of the Assyrian army but you know until you don't buy the book you <laughs> you don't you can't know that but uh, however I think uh, well no le let's see, leave it here for now so starting to talk about this problem of the the actual numbers of the Assyrian armies. Mm -hmm. um, today, by the way, we're going to discuss chiefly about the dual army. We're not going to discuss about the composition of the armies by saying, okay, uh, how many of these guys were, I don't know, auxiliaries and how many were Assyrian. We, we're just sticking essentially to the overall numerical strength and to the um, essentially the infantry, cavalry, and chariot ratio, mm -hmm. <coughs> which I think it's more interesting because also from a tactical point of view, it's more it's more effective. 
than just saying, okay, well, yeah, but these were, I don't know, uh, these were Babylonians, not Assyrians or Elamites, and, and doesn't matter. For now, let's just stick to the actual, to the ensemble. Mm -hmm. That is what tactically makes sense on the battlefield in spite of where, where these guys came from. Um, so, um, just like it happens many times in history, the first, um, mm, let's say, discouraging <laughs> element from the sources, you realize that a few numbers about um, the Assyrian army we know are overly inflated. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about huge numbers that emerge from the sur sources um, that are obviously misleading in terms of quantity because we know that by those times, but not just by, by those time standards, but in general for a long time, armies of more than a maximum of 50,000 soldiers were, were impracticable to use. I mean, I'm not aware right now of grand operations that involved multiple armies, etc. But you really have to think about the, the sheer num amount of resources that was required to move an army of already 50,000. Mm -hmm. So we have this problem actually also in other, in, in every other time in history, um, because most of the times we get these numbers that, uh, especially for the larger uh, armies, are naturally um named uh, they are actually pr they're uh, naturally provided by the sources because it they were big armies so th the thing was that the n in the news that these sources had to spread was look at how many they were mm -hmm. um and it's uh, it's much rare mm, or, um, mm, mm, ver it's very rare let's say to instead find the exact numbers on the actual composition of the army mm -hmm. And especially when it gets to infantry, that nef definitely, uh, at least for these sedentary peoples, were was the um, the most numerous arm. Mm -hmm. uh, we often do not know how many of these guys were the actual uh, fighting force, and how many of them were, let's say, pioneers, for instance, or other people that maybe were um, were there just to guard the uh, baggage train, or, or maybe just bands of more the years that joined. At a certain point, the army is just to, you know, to 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 pillage, to plunder, and and this is especially true in the case of the Assyrians. That, despite in spite having one of the uh, definitely most advanced army o of the time, at least in the, say Western Asia, I think um, they um, they definitely had this kind of character of also of, of mostly um, raiding parties in a sort of, uh, in a sort of sense so you have to imagine even of these very big armies having just a core of effective fighting force mm -hmm. or even troops that were just combat ready because um, you know you there is a big deal of a difference being a fully armored uh, Assyrian infantryman and <coughs> just a guy with a knife uh, or or or, uh, or a spear slash javelin that joined for for other reasons. So unfortunately, um, the the real proportion, the real numbers, is something that we will we'll never know. Uh, just for many other times in history. Uh, this time, for instance, I'm studying uh, something for the 14th century. Uh, in 14th century Europe, relatively to um, medieval armies at the time and um, one of the first problems is we, we get some numbers but we don't actually know um, especially about the infantry how many of these guys were de facto uh, fighting force and other were just assistants or or stuff like that the same goes for cavalry sometimes because the cavalry can be made up of uh, effective a knight and the other can be an esquire then now I'm just generalizing in because also squires actually fought, especially from a certain point onwards. But um, it's difficult. It's, it's still it's still difficult for from these numbers to get any other information attached, mm -hmm. um, and um, this is a bit of a problem in all in all history. But some some certain things can be sort of guessed. Mm -hmm. 
Um, in the case of the Assyrians, there is one major point in favor. Um, that um, in spite of the wild exaggerations in the amount of troops that participated in the campaigns, we have more or less a pretty mm, a similar proportion of the various arms, mm, so infantry, chariotry and cavalry, um, for all these big armies we, uh, we, know, uh, we know about. So starting, let's start with look, giving a look at them, very very briefly and very simply. So um, from uh, we know about the army of Holofernes that attacked Syria and Palestine uh, to be composed of um, 120,000 infantry, tw um, t 12,000 cavalry. Um, and um, we don't have chariots now. Uh, now, who is, who was Olofernes? Olofernes is a kind of a hero. Of, um, he's, I remember from, um, from essentially from the Book of Judith, uh, as a general of uh, Nabuch uh, uh, the Nazar. Mm. Uh, so this great um, uh, Syrian king. And the um, the the idea, however, is that Olofernes is a sort of a historiographical myth hmm, because the even the same name sometimes you can guess this things from just for the name for other like for other times in history is this kind of um, mix of s of different names of people who actually existed or other sort of medical uh, figures that um, is recorded also into Hellenic historiography and it, it, it's that it's a name uh, that in part recurs into the Cappadocian area so it's not really clear whether you know uh, the book of Judith gives this um, this uh, number however um, and um, it's a number that as we will see will fit broadly with um, <coughs> what the sources we have of about the Assy the number is the strength of the Assyrian armies actually state um, so in here we see a plain uh, 1 to 10 uh, in the ratio cavalry uh, infantry um, according to Xenophon, uh, the um, the um, the Assyrians um, brought um, at a point um, tw uh, twenty thousand cavalry and two hundred chariots against Cyrus. Mm -hmm. So here we are in later times in Assyrian history, and we see that um, here there is no infantry instead. Um, so we have just this essentially mounted army, mm. and the, r the relation is um, uh, practically uh, one chariot every 100 horse. Mm. So um, <coughs> that's also a you, you see there, there is this decim decimal relation, mm. more or less. So um <coughs> the um, Um so th th there are other um other uh, things here Herodotus at a point claims that basically the Assyrians who joined uh, with um, Xerxes the uh, first in his um uh, in his um invasion of Greece in 480 BC to to be a, a solely um infantry solely foot troops. Mm. Um, this is also, this might make sense if you, I don't know, maybe you have, you have to think the Persians, I, I'm not uh, much aware about this, but surely having conquered Mesopotamia, they came to uh, basically uh, disarm certain, um, especially the nobility, or at least um, making a sort of um, reducing the potential of the local communities in terms of autonomous military organization, so maybe this was a sort of levy and it didn't involve any more the obviously the, the structure of the Assyrian army how it had been before the Persian the Persian domination. So uh, we have actually a, an enormous uh, evidence, <laughs> extensive evidence of uh, in monuments showing. Uh, depicting soldiers of, of various sorts. I think 
the number of auxiliaries shown um, in overall into the, the Assyrian uh, monuments are like 600 um, more. Um, so this is kind of interesting because you, you realize that in spite of this, um, of the relative uh, low potential of these sources for knowing other things, we have at least um, um, kind of a good I picked visual um, image of uh, how it is um, these um, Assyrians uh, soldiers actually were um, and there is uh, a general relation or general ratio that can be drawn also from here given the number of represented soldiers mm -hmm. so um, and, and we get more or less the proportion of uh, one um, cavalryman for um, 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 excuse me, one chariot for ten horses for um, one hundred um, infantrymen. Mm -hmm. So also in here it would be uh, essentially a, um, a square root of, of ten, basically at every level. And you, um, no, it, uh, I'm, I'm saying pretty something pretty stupid. <laughs> it's, it's not that. I mean, it's, however, um, multiples of 10 in, in, in the relation between uh, infantry, <coughs> cavalry, and, uh, and chariots. So, um, square root of 10 is uh, <laughs> it's not, uh, it's something like, um, it's like um, I don't know. I don't, I don't even remember. Um, I think it's three point something, obviously, because. But whatever this is, uh, this is not a point. And the um, the point though is um, the we we have other evidence that kind of supports these proportions similarly, not not fully actually. Um, Ctesius um, claims that the army of Ninus was composed of 1,700,000 infantry, 210,000 cavalry, and 10,600 chariots. Mm -hmm. Now, this, o this is also another example how these sources can be um, so widely um, um, unreliable as um, Ctesias for instance Ctesias is actually an interesting source because he, he was a Greek from uh, the 5th century BC mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he actually um, uh, was pretty close to the uh, Achaemenid Empire so he actually knew something about that he seemingly was in the um, he was actually a physician, among the other things. So these they were kind of polymatic figures. He was both a physician and a historian. Uh, and he was physician of none others but of the Achaemenid king Art Artaxerxes II. So a person who <coughs> definitely was pretty much involved into the um, uh, the affairs of the um, uh, of the Achaemenid Empire, as he was a Greek from Caria. He was from Cnidus, so he was actually in in one territory that belonged practically to the uh, to the Persian Empire. Seemingly, he um, he uh, was part of uh, Artaxerxes' entourage at the Battle of Cunaxa in 401 um, uh, BC. So he saw this extremely interesting clash between. Um, 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 Cyrus uh, the Younger and his um, Hellenic mercenaries, the ones of the Ten Thousand. Mm -hmm. So it's it's also very interesting about how the Greeks were actually uh, this time pretty much um, present I in, in in all sides into the um, into the Persian world and could observe it. So theoretically, so he um, Ctesias wrote a, a work that is called the Persica. Mm -hmm. And um, they encompass, in this sense, also the the history of Assyria um, and, and and Babylon mm -hmm. before the establishment of the uh, Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. So he mm, 
makes this um, interesting remarks um, and it's pretty useful sources uh, also as a Greek etc but um, talking about this army that we just named the, the army of Ninus wh who was Ninus actually um, Ninus was um, a medical figure it's actually a non-historical figure in practice um, he would have been the eponymous founder of Nineveh hmm? so uh, the the uh, this ancient um, Assyrian city of Upper Mesopotamia would be in today's uh, located to the outskirts of uh, today's Mos Mosul hmm? in the north of Iraq um, and um, uh, and the, this figure is present in to the uh, essentially into the Hellenistic historiography, mm. um, but actually seems to, to have never existed, and it's uh, it's not attested, for instance, in the list of the Assyrian kings. That is this um, 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 in document that is being compiled, essentially from mm, 2500 BC to the roughly the 8th century BC so there is no one actually naming this guy and today he's not even regarded as a properly existing uh, figure so given these numbers that we have just read that are also pretty huge hmm, 1,700,000 infantry 210,000 cavalry and 10,600 chariots I mean this is kind of uh, idiotic <laughs> to, to say it. I mean no it's not idiotic I'm sorry for, for using this adjective uh, it's very idiotic for me to have used it it's not idiotic because it's important however to to have this source um, and uh, because it actually tells us how those people were looking at that past yes it's a, an horrible let's put it in this way inflation of, of numbers but it's still useful for the uh, proportion uh, in practice because if you look at the proportion uh, it, it would be something you can reduce it of let's say uh, 100 for instance and then you have something like uh, 17,000 uh, infantry uh, 2,000 and uh, 100 cavalry and roughly uh, 106 say uh, chariots uh, so this kind of sounds good so it's a proportion of 8 infantry to 1 cavalryman um, 155 infantry to 1 chariot and 18 cavalry to 1 chariot so uh, this is kind of also yeah it's not really in the decimal um, um, it, it, it's not in, in the decimal multiples anymore uh, relations anymore but it's still mm, plausible and this is also interesting because you might wonder you know it was much easier to to have a decimal uh, system here to if you had really to invent the numbers you could do it that way but it's still useful you might wonder where Theseus actually got these sources from we, we have no idea um, also because he's the only one to to, to provide them um, you might argue, I don't know, he maybe invented it from scratch, it is possible, uh, but it might have still corresponded to maybe, I don't know, he had he might have heard of this somewhere when he was into the Persian Empire, and when he traveled into those areas, he might have, I don't know, had access to certain sources, to certain um, witnesses, obviously not of the time, because... Um, Ninus would be a sort of uh, very ancient figure anyway even if he, he did not exist but it, it's something that happened it would have been would have happened a um, uh, lot of, of time before um, so um, it's also interesting how these Hellenic historiographers were essentially allowing themselves and to, to invent in part the uh, these data or at least to comment on things that um, even clearly were part of perhaps not even part of, of the actual memory of the local um, uh, communities in, in, in Mesopotamia so this is also possible 
I, I would like to know more about Actesius uh, Persica actually, but this is not important. Today it's about the ratio of infantry and cavalry. Um, so that's that's what we have seen now and that will suffice. Um, the um, So what you get in here is practically still the idea that the Assyrian army might have been organized on, on a decimal system. Mm. So it seems that uh, there might have been one chariot every uh, 100 cavalry, uh, 10 infantry for every cavalryman, and um, sometimes although um, there is only 10 cavalry per chariot in uh, 100 infantry. So later we will see how we think that this evolved over time because this is also important relatively to um, and it kind of fits, I've already discussed this in, in other videos about the Assyrian army, it kind of fits what we think the, the actual also on, on, our, on the base of other sources what the actual evolution of the um, the tactical evolution of the Assyrian armies was towards uh, the, the last centuries of of their history so um, if you think about these proportions you see that they're not excessively um, you know usually the Assyrian army is credited to have had mostly infantry mm, and that the bulk of it, uh, the Assyrian forces w was infantry which is definitely true mm, and it is true actually for basically all the um, all the ancient armies in history side the ones from the steppes um, so this is pretty normal but if you look actually at the number of of chariots and of cavalry you realize that it wasn't this this few mm -hmm. um, you have also to consider in this sense we, we're talking still about a, a rather primitive world um, with a, um, I mean, primitive in the good sense. Of course, the Assyrians were extremely developed. We're coming after millennia of sanitary civilization as well. Uh, however, they, um, they kind of, mm, you know, th they were still, they were still ar a world. You see, you can see that also into the Persian army, to which um, there were great masses of men that, however, were not framed into this extremely. Um, disciplined fashion. I mean the Persian army, I know actually uh, most of the times I say the contrary, the Persian army was extremely disciplined mm. but it was disciplined for its times. Mm. Uh, obviously when Alexander came to Asia and conquered the Achaemenid Empire you realize that he had a very different army that was based on other principles that were an exception in the ancient world because basically Hellenistic warfare is something that is born out of a very particular process. Um, it obviously entailed more uh, complex tactics, uh, you know, combined arms tactics, and uh, also a certain type of society, a certain type of hardness in part. The Persian army actually um, fell to, to the Macedonians mostly also because it was one of the few moments in history to which um, you don't find a uh, two commanders of more or less equal strength to facing uh, one against each other, um, one against the other. Um, the um, so the idea is that ah yeah the Persian army sucked. No, it didn't. It really didn't, and it was one of the most organized, etc. And um, we can make a by approximation this idea that yeah, it was similar also to what the Persian army uh, to the Assyrian army had been. And infantry was the bulk, really, of these populations. Why? Well, because these were empires that ruled over extremely, um, m very highly populated areas of the world. So the Fertile Crescent is this um, area that was already at the time located on trade routes and definitely had a lot of wealth proper. So a lot of resources could be used definitely to hire also mercenaries all around but the bulk of the army and this, the core of, of the empire was definitely in part this um, this Mesopotamian area mm. in the case of Persia yeah it was shifted a bit towards the east and the Iranian plateau proper but 
generally speaking in history those were lands that more or less remained a bit less powerful than in terms of manpower strictly of manpower not of um, actually of actual strength um, as the Persians managed as meant uh, to conquer the Mesopotamia but uh, it was pretty easy to to raise troops from Mesopotamia this is the point for this commander so and as we were saying before um, raising such large bodies of infantrymen as just it had been for the Assyrians was pretty easy because there was also already some kind of military organization there there was plenty of people uh, it was a fertile area so even the ability to re um, replenish troops would w was pretty pretty out there um, so um, given especially the, the nature of the surrounding enemies it was easy sometimes just to make mass and go crush them mm. uh, maybe yeah there was a picked body of cavalrymen of infantrymen that made up the say the royal troops proper that were much better equipped for instance and much better trained we see this from the Assyrian sources but uh, this large number of infantry were also very important because they could ravage more extensively the uh, the country mm. these were even moving armies like big like I don't know we're talking, we are talking about the range of tens of thousands equated for the ancient world economical potential there to like to to um, to to ravage the lands where they they passed for you know making it a desert for for, for a generation let's say um, so these big raiding parties have and therefore these large numbers have to be understood as part of a broader strategy into a world that was not so extremely uh, advanced as it would have come in relative terms later uh, in later times and um, yeah f maybe I'm over uh, over stressing this as if you know these guys were still primitive there was actually not a big difference also with uh, later times but you know even if you if you take um, uh, ancient warfare you, re you realize how uh, tactics got eventually increasingly more sophisticated how even the state administrations become became more more functional more complex um, the peak of the ancient world world would be the the Hellenistic world until until the late antique times mm -hmm. but whatever this is kind of a of an excursus um, so the um, so talking about Alexander the Great, for instance, his relation of cavalry infantry was something to one to uh, six, um, probably even more in some on some occasion. Um, in, 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 in certain battles, um, also it depends what kind of cavalry you're fielding. Mm -hmm. For instance, at Gal Gamela, seemingly um, um, the Persians had much less cavalry to like 1 to 25 mm -hmm. so it's evident how these um, uh, armies of the, the near and Middle East were more infantry based mm -hmm. they, they were more reliant on this um, millinery tradition that were were actually uh, there um, the Romans had more mm -hmm. in Republican times normally it was uh, one cavalryman every ten infantry, and uh, the uh, relation got uh, the number of cavalrymen increased in the later centuries. So, um, if you take, for instance, the army of uh, using this um, um, kind of uh, proportion, you can make um, of, d of decimal multiples you could claim that for instance the army of Sennacherib between the ru ruled between 705 BC to 781 BC was made up of uh, roughly um, 170 chariots 17,000 cavalry and um, 107 
50,000 infantry. Mm -hmm. uh, the same can go with, um, uh, excuse me, uh, with the uh, army of um, of uh, Shalmaneser the third, who ruled between 859 to 824 BC, so before uh, having roughly 100 chariots, um, 10,000 cavalry, and uh, 100,000 infantry. Mm -hmm. But even these numbers are pretty uh, inflated, mm -hmm. and I don't think they could have fielded uh, such large armies. Um, but um, in we will never know, unfortunately. Sure is that um, if you take 100,000 infantry, surely only a half of them were actually fighting force. The rest might have been just servants, camp aiders, and um, as we said before, um, pioneers. And uh, actually, pioneers were were also combat force in, in, in on some occasion. There is evidence of pioneers being heavily equipped and uh, having this task of even smashing the the enemy uh, fences with uh, with uh, with axes and stuff like that. But also for the sake of organization, you you really can't move all these men. Even if um, the other fifty thousand had been only aides of, of some sort. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, because it, it turns out into a mess. Even think about the strictly hygienic needs. I mean, where do you find, um, uh, 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 if you have to besiege a city, uh, a place to keep something like here? And consider, uh, consider horses here as well. We're talking about 10,000 cavalry, which has definitely some spare horses as well. So you want to make me believe that you can keep an army this big in an area with all the concentrated thing about the uh, the uh, first of all how much a horse needs to drink mm -hmm. and it's not that if you fight uh, you know if you don't find against a um, uh, um, uh, you know a source of fresh water you can't how can you f uh, that that is uh, big enough um, that um, how how are you gonna uh, uh, satisfy their thirst? I, it's impossible. And think also about all the um, uh, all the more strictly and uh, a few people think about this, but actually the uh, the excrement excrements uh, of these animals of, of men. Uh, these are things that if you have a l such a large camp, you necessarily have to work out certain um, uh, canalizations. You need to have uh, um, water that passes there. Uh, I I don't know. Maybe this uh, might have been possible into the uh, into the uh, into the fertile crescent proper along the Tigris and the Euphrates. But let's be honest. Also in here, it required a huge um, field engineering. And I'm not saying that the Assyrians didn't have this because they were pretty advanced in such things, but um, it would have been an excessive number, a much greater burden just to set up, uh, set up everything and to make them move as one. It, it's, it's simply impossible. Already, fifty thousand fighting force is a uh, or, or or people in general, not even a single fighting force. Fifty thousand people to coordinate is uh, is a miracle in the ancient world. Nothing more, nothing less. So every time you read a source that states more than that, you can legitimately uh, say that it's uh, too much. Mm -hmm. um, so the um, so these various proportions. Um, the you actually tell us that infantry made up a ninety percent approximately of the Assyrian armies. Mm -hmm. the cavalry was something like a nine percent and um or slightly more and uh chariotry like a one percent. This is actually the, the, the number as well. Um there is however another thing that we can do that I think is more interesting because um, at this point, 
saying okay th this um, army was this big and that it, it's m also pretty relative in in actual military uh, aspects because um, what is this army made up of for instance hmm. and uh, how in, in strictly military historical terms did actually the the uh, the Assyrian army uh, evolve so these are actually the, the most important um, questions because otherwise you can neither fully understand what these armies were were created for at least w for w for which uh, tactical and strategical task mm -hmm. so since our uh, sources about numbers are so scanty let's concentrate however on that few and very and extremely, I'd say, tentative proportions that um, we can find throughout time uh, into uh, relatively to the uh, to the uh, Syrian army and trying to to tell something about how the Syrian army evolved over time, mm -hmm. also in tactical specialization. So let's start from um, from the time of Ashurbanipal ruled between 668 BC to 727 uh, BC. Um, um, no, sorry. I would like to... No, Ashurbanipal should definitely go at the end <laughs> since it was uh the the one so from which year can we start let's start from the beginning of the ninth century bc mm? and let's end to uh, as far as we know the the, uh, the seventh century the end of the seventh century bc so it's roughly 100 um 250 years Let's start from the army of Ashur Nasirpal the second, and let's give a look to the um, composition of his army. So we have. So this is also pretty attentive and uh, attentive, sorry, and tentative, and we are looking at it in a sort of um, um, really approximate way so don't take these numbers as literal but uh, just as a uh, as an uh, as a speculation based on, on the evidence we have also from the um, from monument things like iconographic sources so we don't really know how many of these troops were and if they were like this as a matter of fact but this can help us trace sort of evolution over time so the army of Ashur Nasser Paul II was made up by a good for 40, uh, say 70% mm -hmm. of heavy and light spearmen coupled with archers. Mm -hmm. And every archer had seemingly shield bearer on his own. This is a characteristic that I, that I talked about when discussing the Assyrian infantry. So you can go check the video out. It explains it a bit better from a strictly... F um, tactical point of view and how these guys worked in pair during combats during combat sorry so this is important because it provides a 70% of essentially spearmen mm -hmm. um, supported by archers that ha seemingly have been the really the the base of all Assyrian armies mm -hmm. um, traditionally speaking to this we add a 10% of light swordsmen seemingly so troops that could even be used as sort of um, assault uh, shock force mm -hmm. um, and then 10 percent of pioneers mm -hmm. which adds up to 90 percent and more or less another 10 percent of cavalry made up of light archers with attendants now this is interesting uh, cavalry is relatively few, but uh, it seemingly was pretty mobile. Mm 
and um, and capable of skirmishing and um, and and and, uh, and carrying out other operations like scouting, exploring, etc. Mm -hmm. But a big mass is of infantry um, that also has this defensive and offensive power based especially on archery. Mm -hmm. And this uh, um, archers protected by um, spearmen. So passing to, to the army of, of Sargon II, who ruled between 722 uh, uh, to 705 uh, BC, so we're a bit later indeed, uh, we have um, a slight change. So we have a just a 40% of light archers and spearmen. The heavy spearmen are not here anymore. This is interesting because it, it, it means that this potential is kind of um, lost in part. Um, there is another like 35% of medium archers that got seemingly also segmented in, into other subtypes. Then we ha we have the light swordsmen also have seemingly decreased. Mm -hmm. They are half of what they were on in, in proportion to what they were in Ashur Nasser Paul II's army. Then cavalry has remained slightly uh, this is essentially the same, maybe a slightly greater in number. And this is made up both of spearmen and archers. So this is interesting because the first difference is you notice that uh, infantry got lighter and with more archers. Mm -hmm. So the offensive, um, the missile potential of this army has increased in the uh, sheer numbers of the troops. Now we don't know compared to Ashur Nasser Paul how many you know heavy and I, I mean how many spearmen were compared to archers so we we don't really know how it is evolved um, in, in numbers of the same but seemingly uh, this got as a lighter um, essentially the, the proportion of infantry and cavalry remained the same but something changed within them infantry is lighter cavalry is lighter uh, slightly heavier because we have still light cavalry but um, some of them it's it's mount mounted spearmen mm -hmm. now I'm not saying that in Ashur Nazir Paul II uh, uh, army there weren't uh, mounted spearmen mm -hmm. it's kind of silly to think so but it might have been the case that a bit more of this shock force not just light archers were, in, were added to to cavalry to make it more flexible now this first this change is Kind of, kind of interesting, because um, Sargon the Second's army seems to, to have been a bit more flexible overall, mm -hmm. and lighter, and, and in this sense also cheaper, mm -hmm. and um, and with a with an increased mobility and uh, reaction uh, capability due to uh, a greater versatility of of cavalry of some sort. Also, we don't find attendance in here. So the whole thing is telling us, in my opinion, that um, a lot of kind of the heaviest... I mean, these, these troops might have actually started to come from other uh, strata of the population, or maybe not non-Assyrian troops as well. Um, so a kind of a, a push towards professionalism, professionalization of the Assyrian army that didn't involve this kind of even maybe more ritualized um, warfare that was typical of the early Assyrian armies um, and that remained in part in this idea of the nobility that also took part etc but uh, uh, the fight etc but this fi this thing of the light archers that would attendance in Ashur Nazar Pal's the second army mm, it's it says you know this cavalry probably uh, cavalrymen were Maybe not just simple cavalrymen. Mm -hmm. it, it, it sounds like they, w they were a bit more uh, some an, uh, an aristocratic kind. So not just maybe um, light archers as um, this factota, as this um, you know um, sweepers, but something more 
more interesting and, and this is interesting because you see that the nobility in this sense might have had uh, or this gentry, I, I don't know I'm, I'm just speculating now whether in the first place I, I'm not even sure these were uh, noblemen at all but the attendants are yeah maybe the attendants are just at this point something like every cavalry had uh, attendants but usually light archers at least the ones we, we, we see on average in the rest of military history really didn't have m many attendants. The attendants were usually the ones of knights mm, rather than throw away uh, light, cheap cav light cavalry. But what is important is in Sargon II's army the cavalry probably seems to be even more dynamic. Mm. Maybe relying also on combined tactics even that there are light archers and light spearmen mm. So something that can support one another and act in tandem in some measure. And um, this is not something you have really to struggle a lot to find because probably most cavalrys at that time worked that way. It sounds uh, a bit like as if Ashur, uh, uh, Ashur Nazir Pals II's light archers were kind of more, you know, people who joined the army from the upper classes um, just to stay there with an attendant throwing some arrow and and, and, and and that's it and also the presence of a heavy spearman in there it implies someone who is kind of heavier and that might have come from the uh, gentry of the um, Mesopotamian cities um, that over time kind of got tired of war they didn't want to spend that much and kind of also began to fight a bit more distant from the usual on average and um, and don't want to participate anymore they prefer to stay at home so that uh, this produces in Sargon's II uh, army a um, sort of uh, you know okay also uh, it was probably less expensive um, for Sargon II to, f to field naturally lighter troops and not just in terms of resources mm -hmm. but also in terms of um, political um, negotiation uh, in some sort and um, and this still allowed maybe um, a bit more of dynamism as um, maybe the troops who joined were started to in be increasingly professional mm, of, of people who joined the army just for you know for, for making a living out of it rather than participating because the ancient custom was to, to go to war into these Mesopotamian cities but as the as the Assyrian army ex uh, uh, empire extends expands um, um, this kind of troops uh, join kind of from from everywhere not just from the usual milieu of, of the best equipped and it's interesting because you don't find kind of heavy spearmen anymore in in the following centuries um, but I discussed this when I talked about his uh, Assyrian infantry tactics and kind of made it a bit clearer in there so passing to Sen uh, Sennacherib army um, Sennacherib ruled from 705, uh, just like uh, after after second uh, Sargon the second. Mm. So from 705 BC to um, to 700 uh, uh, 681 BC. Mm. So just after. And w what do you see? And here is yet another development. So. Relatively to infantry, light archers ha ha um, are less in number. They're almost one half, a half of um, in Sargon's the second's army. They're roughly a, a one fourth of the army. Mm -hmm. These are still uh, these are of two types now, seemingly, and they are coupled with spearmen. Mm -hmm. Then you find medium archers at this point also two types that are coupled with spearmen as well medium archers in Sargon II's army had not been coupled with spearmen mm. 
and here, here we find them and there are also slightly more than in Sargon's army because they, they made, up, made up like a 40 percent then you find a 50 percent of of medium sling of slingers essentially hmm? this is interesting because um, it kind of tells us that probably the, the Assyrians were taking these guys from the wilder areas now so the the uh, hypothesis that now the Assyrians were taking these troops from the less uh, civilized areas around Mesopotamia is kind of a kind of makes sense. The slingers usually are uh, hired uh, from um, shepherds, uh, communities, uh, mountaineers, etc. And these and in fact, the Assyrian army is uh, um, the Assyrian uh, Empire is expanding throughout this time. Um, pioneers remain always there, like this 10% force that etc. Cavalry remains also in here in the same proportion, which is very interesting, uh, but it gets heavier, seemingly. Their troops are better equipped and they remain both um, archers and spearmen. And seemingly the spearmen kind of decrease at this point slightly compared to archers, but this is just pure speculation at this point. Um, and uh, they form up this 10% roughly uh, of the whole army. Uh, so what does this mean in Se Sennacherib for Sennacherib's army? Well, um, well, it essentially me uh, means that now. Um, the actually the offensive capability is increased. Uh, swordsmen are not present anymore. So, but at the same time, you realize that there are some more bit of more of spearmen sp always attached to the to the archers compared to Sargon the Second's time. Probably, um, I don't know if these calculations are correct. It, it might seem as if Sarkon the Second's army had got too lighter from the one of um, of the previous times, and um, yeah, it had increased the um, the missile capability, but it still needed a bit more of protection for the same for the missile troops. So that in here you find that medium uh, uh, that archers are coupled all with spearmen, and they get seemingly heavier, and even the slingers are. A bit heavier than it's not. They're they're not simply light. They have some form of light armor or medium armor. Mm -hmm. um, so this speaks, according to me, in favor also of an increased um, not just professionalism, but sort of um, a sort of increasing also interaction between these. Um, troops because they get a bit more homogeneous mm -hmm. especially if you look at the bulk of the 40 percent of medium archers it tells you that the archers now are kind of um, and, and, and the medium slingers that add up to another 15 percent so we are talking about essentially missile troops that are over that made up over the 50 percent although we don't really know how many were the spearmen that, that were attached to the archers at this point but they're still a very consistent part of it, and these are all heavier, seemingly. They have a medium equipment. Mm. Um, so this probably emerged from kind of need of protecting these um, missile troops, and and this tells you that we're probably also not just purely missile troops, but they could also have some form of, I can say of engagement, but maybe I mean, they were more exposed. They they were um, more dynamic, and that's where they 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 needed uh, increased protection. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the happening of cavalry speaks a little bit for this. Mm -hmm. So it's as if cavalry wasn't able just to um, also took more losses mm -hmm. um, and and needed at this point more protection. Uh, relatively to this, it's interesting that the slingers figure into for the first time, because um, probably um, both archers and and uh, both infant Assyrian infantry and cavalry at this point had expanded into two areas more frequently, at least in two areas where they could 
find and hire uh, slingers, but they could also be targeted by slingers. Mm -hmm. So increased protection was augmenting, and uh, it was a pretty standard need. So this is really a bit of a um, of perfectionment. I don't know how to say that a of strengthening of the uh, the troops that requires also a little more effort from the state to fill them, and probably also um, uh, um, increasing the professionalism of these troops as well. So a more direct relation between the state that hires them, employs them, and um, and uh, the the use of these troops abroad. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is very important because when seasonalism finishes into the local warfare and you have to fight for longer times than just a good season or you have to stay abroad for, for years even, um, you you need uh, naturally you, you you transform your army into a traditional into a professional one which is pretty pretty obvious from a militia into a professional army um, looking at uh, Ashurbanipal instead we um, so he ruled between um, 668 BC to 627 BC so also a pretty long reign what we have here is yet another change. So this might be um, interesting as well. Because um, there is a, an inverted trend of the... Um, and Um, the we have essentially a lighter infantry at this point once again. Um, the the number of um, um, uh, especially archers and, and slingers as well, uh, they made up still a uh, overall a uh, eighty percent of the army. So this is something pretty pretty large. Um this is um a um so we have practically eighty percent of light missile troops. Um some of the um oh sorry. Here I, I got it wrong. Um, it's not mi all missile troops. It's actually a fifty percent of missile troops, mm -hmm. light slingers and light and medium archers still. But we have a coming back of spearmen in greater numbers. Although we don't really know whether this is true because we have light and medium spearmen that are uh, roughly a thirty percent. Now we don't know how many these spearmen were when coupled with the archers. Um, the um, um, the overall picture is that there is more light infantry, mm -hmm. but probably more specialized between, more clearly defined between spearmen and archers. Mm -hmm. So not spearmen coupled with archers anymore, which kind of makes sense according to me also in strictly organizational and tactical uh, logics because um, this probably corresponded to a going past beyond a certain type of more disordered fight. I never actually understood how um, this couple of archer and in, in spearmen could or or assistant with a shield could actually work on the field and as far as I know from the evidence we we get this idea that archers uh, towards the end of the Assyrian Empire began to act like full bodies of archers of uh, formations of archers and spearmen as full formations of spearmen so um, that kind of makes sense and, and it, it shows us also probably a more ordered and disciplined army mm -hmm. that could interact between these larger blocks of of clearly specialized troops 
and not this strange mix of um, of um, archers followed at close range by guys who were holding the shield at them or or coupled with with, with spearmen, etc. Which speaks in about something probably more disordered than what we can. Um, mm, something a bit disordered, although um, we almost we, we we have got th this idea chiefly from iconographic sources that might not tell it all. Mm. Um, I I also in here in the Assyrian infantry tactics videos video I discussed uh, the how those sources could be interpreted mm, in my opinion of course and I think there is a bit of uh, license mm, b uh, behind our artistical license because the you know unless we're not talking about uh, certain bodies of uh, more disordered formations you, you can't really make that fit into something functional in my opinion um, but whatever, I'm not gonna repeat myself. I think this video sucks, by the way, um, because I'm explaining myself so poorly. Um, so what we see also um, in in this Ashurbanipal's army is uh, the persistence of slingers, in the same numbers, um, although with lighter equipment. Um, then we have mm, the the same percentage of pioneers of the other armies, but with um, coupled with other troops within it, such as axemen and macemen, uh, all with some kind of armor. Um, this is also interesting. It it sounds as if these troops got increasingly specialized into kind of um, siege warfare mm -hmm. or field fortifications and all. Um, the the idea is if you attach so because usually pioneers are not extremely um you know historically speaking they uh, you you could make him work with you know a few you know slaves who could perform those tasks um although uh, at this point you realize that um naturally for siege warfare you you needed some kind of specialized troops as well to carry out certain specific tasks and the fact that pioneers are, are coupled with axemen and macemen, it's, it, it, it sounds like not just um, with pioneers that are increasingly more active. Huh? So they're kind of almost elite. Um, so they're not just people who, who serve to, I don't know, build up bridges and etc. But it, they're people who are actually involved into direct combat more than it had been before. Normally all pioneers are involved in combat, but one thing is the guy that just have to carry some material. One other thing is the guy who has maybe to breach the enemy walls at the same time and attacking with these weapons like maces and, and axes that are... Mm, and with armor, by the way. Um, and, th th and especially weapons tells us that there was a pretty strong um, uh, chance these guys would have to use them as other armored opponents. So it's as if this Assyrian pioneers got increasingly heavier um, to carry out more effectively certain um, incursions, mm -hmm. uh, certain to to penetrate the the, the enemy breaches and to to storm them, mm -hmm. in part. Kind of makes sense also because axes and maces are kind of more practical also in. Um, storming a a fortress than shield and, and spear mm -hmm. they give you this more dynamic and more traumatic impact essentially especially against enemies that when in defense are probably also more keen to to be uh, more heavily armored in some in some sort not always but if they if, if you're storming a city that doesn't want to give up probably the city has some stores some warehouses with uh, weapons and all. So if you want to storm uh, a city like that you have to prepare to, to a pretty stubborn resistance and maces and axes are pretty good weapons to break through 
solid masses of people. Um, and uh, so this is kind of very high quality of pioneers you have in here. Um, just like storm stormtroopers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another very interesting point in here is that cavalry decreased in numbers. It got to a roughly a five percent. Um, and we find um, essentially a mixed body of spearmen and archers. Mm -hmm. So just keep in mind this is also very sp this is all very um, speculation. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not really true, but this is the few evidence we have. So the idea is, how did this cavalry actually turn out? Well, it turned out probably to be less important, evidently, because the specialization remains essentially the same at one of uh, the time of Sennacherib, mm -hmm. so spearmen and archers, but uh, it's they're like a half of them, numerically. Um, so from this last thing it's um, it seems as if the Syrian army was instead going towards a um, specializing a, a bit more for siege warfare rather and and uh, and less open ground warfare let's say because less cavalry um, kind of elite pioneers um, all these, by the way, um, there is new numbers of spearmen added now, light and, and medium, so kind of troops that can swarm into a city if you, if you wanna. And they're not. Uh, this is also very important. They're not attached to archers. This could be also a pretty interesting hint for that because it means that the archers now they are out on their own, in a more sophisticated, also in a more disciplined formation and the spearmen are kind of free to be engaged more independently from archers. Mm -hmm. So maybe to storm, to follow the pioneers and the assault troops into the enemy breaches and and um, overwhelming the enemies with sheer numbers. Um, so I, f I find this is kind of interesting. We should check together with the with the evolution of um, um, of troops at this time, um, the there were certain um, certain also very long range operations. The Assyrians um, uh, went as far as the Kushite Empire at this time. And uh, they repressed certain results, uh, um, certain uh, sorry, certain um, revolts. They definitely stormed cities, kept storming them. The, the Assyrians at this time were um, really uh, the leading um, army in um, in the Near East in terms of, and also the military, let's say, in Western Eurasia, to siege warfare. And at this point, they, they, they were really the largest empire that the world had ever seen. They, they encompassed a huge amount of territories. So probably also the need of kind of keeping these guys um, subjected, subjugated, um, had more to do with uh, these um, siege operation. S um, this kind of sounds strange but I kind of imagine this all the populations that the, the Assyrians had conquered sometimes were just like like in the case of Egypt uh, at this time was rebelling um, they were already urbanized areas so the chances are that these guys revolted by simply enclosing themselves into the cities and hoping to resist to the enemy it wasn't they weren't just fresh uh, peoples would with functional armies that could meet the Assyrians in open battle. Uh, it could happen, but if you're revolting, you're you're just you know it, it's much more preferable to to make a war of attrition mm -hmm. and to be left alone through that. So just saying, it's not worth it. So it's not a phase into which into which these peoples were on the offensive on their own as a fresh. Uh, the Assyrians had conquered basically almost everything, so uh, 
best thing you can do was revolting and closing yourself into your sieges. So this might explain what Ashurbanipal's troops were at this point so in seemingly increasingly specializing into um, assault troops um, for storming the enemy uh, fortresses and not much uh, and, and reducing the number of cavalry because infantry is what you need essentially for siege operations and uh, and while cavalry is something that has to do with more mobile uh, we say with more dynamic strategic theaters hmm. um, with greater mobility for etc so having said this this is pure speculation hmm. um, so I mean not pure but uh, it's um, it's really a very few to say okay this is true but I think it kind of fits into the idea. Mm. You, you find an original situation to which the into the ninth century to which the Assyrian army was a bit more used to the local fight between the cities with still uh, the heavier guys from these um, um, urban classes that could go to the field still fighting this weird kind of weird but maybe it, it wasn't really surely uh, this being couple uh, this couple of um, archers and, and infantry etc then you see um, that uh, with a few cavalry so it was mostly about infantry then you see infantry gets lighter it increases missile uh, capabilities and also cavalry increases and then all this starts to get also homogeneously heavier so this is a phase of expansion this uh, phase also specializ specialization of cavalry so this is a dyna dynamic army that needs to mostly to move mm -hmm. and to engage the enemy into open ground then you see towards the end less cavalry because now the, the Assyrian Empire has been built so yeah cavalry might have uh, existed naturally for running back and forth into this empire so we don't really know there, there are certain contradictions in these logics but at the same time you find something very clear is that um, first of all infantry and uh, I mean spearmen and, 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 and archers are kind of a bit on separated so there isn't that st strictly traditional fight of the origins and these are separated bodies that evidently work a bit on their own pr so they keep interacting for sure but more as larger formations so this tells you that probably also the Syrian Empire had invested some resources into the um, the training of these larger bodies of troops so the state had been a bit more effective also in, in framing this the records into something more uh, impersonal let's say and um, and um, and you see these assault troops that cor might correspond to you know to this increased need of, of storming and 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 punishing the enemy rebelling cities the rebelling cities so this is my very personal interpretation of the war and it kind of makes sense um, ideally then I don't want to force this too much because it's pretty much obvious that the Assyrian army as every other army at this time was functional a bit for every one of these tasks mm. and it was the, m the most advanced army of, of the time so uh, in there so the um, do not be so uh, sharply um, you know do not take my words as if uh, now that's how it went because we don't really know fully we just have uh, relatively to well we talk about ch uh, territory well let's talk about it now um, chariot territory uh, was um, was par p possibly also segmented in here in heavier and lighter units just like the rest of the cavalry um, we know that under Ashur Nasir Pal II so at the beginning the um, chariots were a few like like one percent of the wall army it is um, um, and and but this was still the highest kind of point we reach with that then eventually cavalry kicks in more consistently and 
and charity sinks again so this is interesting because it um, so it kind of varied between 1% to 0.1% and the fact that uh, charity decreases is very meaningful because charity also be belong it kind of backs the, the, the speculations it was making today because it kind of shows uh, you know chariots were chariots were kind of declining at this point into warfare um, they uh, they were surpassed essentially by the um, increasing um, progress of, of infantries especially the sea peoples had made uh, with their infantries their charity warfare chariot warfare uh, collapse mm -hmm. as it had ruled during the Bronze Age for a very long time um, and and cavalry is more flexible it's more dynamic it's something you can rely on more easily um, it's in part also less costly um, and more flexible in general and um, so what happens though is that it's not much about you know it this is also in relative terms because cavalry is not something you want to use you know up to the time to which uh, light chariots were effective um, why not using them mm -hmm. um, so cavalry is a response to this decline but um, another response is that probably chariots got heavier and that's what you see because you, you find still chariots into Hellenistic warfare like in 2nd century BC and uh, you, you might be wondering but w what were they about well they, they were probably larger than they were before you know we know it actually that Hellenistic um, chariots were something much heavier. They were very big things. Um, um, they 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 required even some like four horses. Uh, even if this this has been debated, but the idea was is that they were something that could smash into the enemy lines for the sheer size of the thing. Mm. Obviously, obviously, also in here. Um, wasn't much about the actual shock effect but the um, the psychological effect of all these chariots together we we have made a, I, I made a video about the battle of um, I don't remember what was the name um, in, in which I explained that because it was a war between the Greeks and the Persians um, how was the name I can't remember it's um, Oh wait, well, yeah, I, I remember now. It's it was the battle of um, the battle of Dashilium. Yeah, that is three hundred ninety-five BC. So not excessively far from now. And that's a case of a of a few chariots that actually destroyed a an oplite phalanx. So, and although it was um, was a pretty disordered phalanx at that point. Um, but that's still interesting because it tells you how these uh, chariots were still effective but mostly as they were larger mm -hmm. so they didn't go um, you know this constant um, um, uh, they didn't carry out this constant arrow fire and then not impacting they were conceived as much something much uh, heavier that had to smash into the enemy lines well the first <coughs> chariots also in the Bronze Age didn't work like that they <coughs> they were much more agile and they were conceived in order to to hit the enemy with lots of arrows uh, a bit like the writer <coughs> tactics the caracol tactics in the Renaissance and then attack and, and then overwhelming with the sheer uh, number of chariots followed by infantrymen the, the enemies uh, now in, in Assyrian times things have changed and they are changing towards that direction so it's interesting to see that the number of chariots decreases because that's perfectly in line with how mm, uh, warfare was uh, evolving but um, at the same time probably the kind of chariots that they used were heavier and we will maybe see it uh, another time but the trend is essentially this one so together we will not talk about um, who was who, how many troops participated, uh, how many foreign troops participated to the Assyrian army, which which actually would seem would add a bit more to today's video because 
um, uh, it would show how obviously the Assyrians increasingly real, uh, relied on um, allied troops sometimes that uh, were also quite numerous and this definitely added um, you know it, it was something profitable for them because you could they could raise the people to, to fight for them in their place so um, and uh, but this is pretty standard for every kind of uh, empire um, in history but aside from this um, yeah I know for mm, let's say um, f f foreseeing these changes naturally was wasn't um, uh, you know, th these are not changes that happen from one day to, to another. So it, you don't have to think as if these uh, Syrian armies were evolving by having by having foreseen everything, uh, how it had to go. They they were naturally adapting to situations that were changing very slowly. Mm -hmm. We're talking about centuries today now. We just saw very scantily how the thing evolved from uh, the 9th uh, century BC to the to the beginning of the uh, the seventh, so um, it's a kind of a um, long process. So char war, war chariots were still out there for for a long time. Um, so perhaps um, the beginning of the video sucked. <laughs> I didn't like it much because um, I was quoting all those um, numbers and didn't make maybe a good point. But I liked at least how this last. Um, impression from the uh, proportions the ratio of infantry and cavalry actually worked uh, because according to me it has a pretty logical evolution and this probably adds up um, to the to the realism that is attached sometimes to certain depictions of the Assyrian armies in in uh, relate in terms of how uh, of the proportion of uh, infantry cavalry and um, and, and their uh, su sub specializations and how mm, they they actually tell us how the armies were evolving like and this is also important because sometimes you read the sources and you say oh, well okay but you look at these sources mostly uh, from the Assyrian monuments you say oh well but maybe this is just a bit ideal actually Assyrian art is pretty uh, realistic in certain things naturally it's not the Renaissance art, <laughs> but uh, it's still it's still very detailed, and there are many um, interesting things you can spot from there. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an expert, but uh, you know, aside they're beautiful to watch, but you realize even from the details of the equipment of all these uh, types of troops, and the Assyrian army makes uh, a bit of a uh, of a unicorn in history for these um, kind of. Uh, for instance, the, the, the couple of uh, spearmen and archer. Mm -hmm. That is not something you find easily out there, especially the way they are represented. In there, I think there is a bit of artistical license, but I think there is no reason to doubt more than much that the armies that are represented into the Assyrian monuments as a wall are pretty realistic of what you know they're really represented. And probably it wasn't just in here a merely artistical depiction. Mm -hmm. um, these depictions were naturally political slogans, um, but uh, even the same uh, representing a certain type of soldier rather than another. By the way, they're pretty dynamic um, pictures sometimes. They're not um, very stylized. They, they, you know, there is a lot of action in those pictures as well but this is also if you look at the Egyptian sources I mean it's not a, a, a one century uh, a one uh, millennium before I mean um, this art was pretty realistic in some ways pretty dynamic it really showed um, things as they I can say as they were but uh, that are that really emphasize the actions and the dynamism. So it's um, even looking at the composition of Assyrian armies through the monuments, it's not completely um, uh, speculative. Let's say it has a meaning, and and since it's coupled with uh, and being coupled with with other sources and how especially reasoning how about how the reasoning on how the uh, the the Assyrian uh, Empire was was transforming. 
probably uh, mm, uh, there is something that really you can draw of substantial from those sources don't take it as a mere artistical representations mm -hmm. merely artistical representation but for now um, I don't know how many other videos I will be making about the Syrian army because um, sometimes there is not really a lot to say or at least I'm, I have no competence in this particular field. Uh, there, there is actually a lot to say about the Syrian army um, and uh, you can find um, especially this is a, a topic they haven't that they haven't touched yet but uh, looking at how all the various um, um, the various um, troops were um, for instance, I haven't properly talked about uh, the um, the Syrian army organization this time proper because I've discussed essentially its evolution, their tactical speciali specialization, but not really told, for instance, how it was recruited mm, or how it was organized at a uh, level of um, you know. Uh, at an administrative level. I haven't talked about how um, the Assyrians interacted with the local populations, how these local populations were military or, or militarily organized. It's also an important point because just like the Persians, the Assyrians came into a world that was already developed. They already have certain military traditions that influence hmm, one another in turn. I mean, the Persians and the Assyrians are kind of similar in, in many ways. They, they obviously they have a lot of differences also in, uh, but um, say there is a continuity. Sometimes this is what you see uh, many times in history, is that um, in especially in those areas that kind of had the greatest, um, the most ancient developments in civilizations, like take the in this case the Fertile Crescent was the, the first one in absolute terms then right after the uh, the denial valley and then the indus river and the, the yellow uh, river uh, so these are essentially the the, the four main um, uh, cradles of civilization seemingly seemingly the mesopotamians were the ones that in, in um, developed um, kind of all the others not this is also a, a brutal approximation because it's not really how it happened it's seemingly but however only Egypt at, at the time uh, you know follows um, there are certain developments of Egyptian civilization that came right after like a few tens of years after the Mesopotamian ones and from from that we realized that Egypt had already developed had already the basis for developing its own civilization but it's seemingly I know this is very debated in, into anthropology. Um, ha, mm, I mean, the problem of um, you know how s s uh, human societies developed uh, their civilization and whether they started uh, things uh, on their own or, or rather if they were influenced by others. I'm actually, um, I mean, uh, I think that both things happen. Mm. You you realize also in military history that certain I mean, men do not really have uh, to to learn from one another for coming up with certain things. However, you realize also that certain civilizations are kind of influent mm, in um, uh, on others, and that especially certain stages of civilization maybe are not triggered essentially by the the stimulus, the influence of other civilizations, but kind of are backed mm, by it. So um, when I studied history of uh, when I studied these things, essentially it was a history of religions, but it kind of touched also anthropological problems. I studied it as if you know everything kind of evolved from Mesopotamia and Egypt, also in India and in China, uh, as a consequence, uh, practically. But mm, I, 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 it's very controversial in, in certain sense. Um, I believe it partly, but partly I say, okay, well, but there was something else as well. And, uh, and, and we're talking about the very origins.
but the point I wanted to make, uh, because eventually these civilizations kind of evolved on their own, and they kind of all got their own characteristics, but um, peculiar characteristics. But um, what I wanted to say is that a lot of empires that are formed over these areas uh, eventually tend to absorb the same characteristics of the local uh, of the previous civilization. I mean, it's pretty obvious you see it uh, many times in history. You know, the Fertile Crescent was fought over for, um, you know, for f up to now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people are still fighting for the Fertile Crescent now. Obviously, yeah, our energetic needs have really shifted a bit, like the interests in, in, in certain ki types of resources. But if you take the Fertile Crescent, it's, it's always been disputed by someone you have the Assyrians and even before obviously but you have the Assyrians then you have the Persians then you have the Macedons then you have uh, the Romans then you have the Persians I mean I I again um, it went on and on and then the Abbasids came the, I mean the Caliphate came uh, then the, the Seljuks then the the, uh, the, Mon uh, the Mongols and the uh, so and so on, and so on, and 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 this is something that you find also uh, elsewhere. So w when you look at the organization of these troops, especially of, of these armies, especially in uh, in such moments that were relatively primitive, relatively, um, I say, uh, with a, a low technological potential. Uh, you realize there is a big deal of continuity also with the local military traditions. Mm. So um, it's important to focus on this if you really wanted to understand how these armies worked in the first place. And, uh, and there is also a lot of other things to talk about. I ha will have to talk about Egypt as well. I just don't know how much in detail I can go. Um, Today, I, I say I'm saying this because today I wanted to make a video about the um, Assyrian helmets. And I know that Assyrian helmets are cool, but I, I don't think I, I could have done a longer video in, in 15 minutes, which <laughs> probably you would say, well, finally, maybe something shorter. Well, yeah, but uh, I'm not used to, to fire, to say, I, I don't, not really interested in talking just a few. So, um, for now, I let's stop it here, and uh, I will come up with these uh, more ancient worlds, say, from the ar the ar the armies and enemies of these major civilizations from roughly the fourth millennium and uh, the f uh, the first millennium BC. Huh? So, um, this uh, this is for now how back in time we venture in although I might make something also about prehistoric warfare that I find to be very interesting because uh, very few people talk about this really and um, the reason being that you realize that w when you have a few sources uh, there is much room there is more room left for speculation and speculation can be fueled sometimes with uh, ideological stance mm. um, and uh, especially for prehistoric warfare there is um, a big deal of ideology uh, ideological debate relatively to it I would like to maybe um, give just the essential also because I know almost nothing about it but I know something and I um, and that's something I think I, I got it right <laughs> in, in some way or at least in a way that is plausible um, and that can be interesting for a video but for now we'll uh, I don't know in, uh, probably tomorrow we'll make a video about once again medieval history something about ships in the later middle ages um, and then the day after tomorrow probably something about uh, the feudal age so military history um, again so um, and um, another thing I, I've seen th th there is some of you um, then I will repeat it this um, uh, sometime but there is some of you who still asks me for um, for dedicated videos 
well, mm, um, you're right because in, in my very first videos I, I said, okay, now I don't have a, I have a lot of free time. You can ask me which kind of video uh, you may want. Uh, so you can definitely keep suggesting video topics because uh, I know what you're mostly interested in and I think that's important but um, I don't have this huge time to now to, to choose um, I mean I have a very complicated system that allows me to talk every day <laughs> about something but um, about something new but this paradoxically takes me away um, at the opportunity to talk about something you ask me but just know that for the record everything that is comprehended between the um, this fourth millennium BC and the up to this point the 17th century warfare will be covered in some fashion hmm? probably going to towards the modern age at this point I won't be discussing much about battles but about broader topics like uh, I don't know it's like the uh, military organization or uh, other political and social phenomena that had um, uh, consequences obviously in the organization of the armed forces and warfare proper recently I made those videos about the Dragonnad, about the Polish army uh, the Polish Lithuanian army in the 17th century so something that yeah goes towards also more recent times but everything especially about the ancient world and the Middle Ages will be covered mm -hmm. I have a BS for uh, for the Middle Ages, uh, as you probably realized uh, by now. Uh, but also, um, ancient warfare is very, very important, and I really care about it, and I will discuss it uh, thoroughly because that was my first passion in in military history, and I kind of well, perhaps not the earliest fa passion, but it was something I wanted to be an ancient historian once I wanted to be I wanted to study Roman warfare and uh, I basically did on my own <laughs> even when I became a medievalist and I mm, so I have a lot of things to say about the Romans that I I realize I don't talk ex excessively much about but this is also probably a matter of uh, it was randomly decided uh, but yeah I'm covering everything bit by bit and it, it takes a while and uh, meanwhile I also hope you appreciate um, my videos about general medieval history because I, I put a lot of care in them it's naturally the field I, I know best so it's the one that, that is much more easier for me to make videos on and that's the reason why I, I talk about it because I need to make lots of videos that make sense at this point because I want the channel to grow quickly and to to get it this out of out, out of the way um, uh, soon, I mean, uh, to to grow with some <laughs> consistent number. Um, but uh, I realize that some of you are more interested in ancient history than medieval history, and I realize this because I realize this um, because I thought a bit like you uh, myself at the beginning. But uh, I can assure you that. Um, it's very very important not to remain stuck to just either the Middle Ages or either the ancient era because um, the um, especially if you study military history because military history is something human it's something universal and it doesn't change basically anything to study uh, I don't know uh, the Gulf War or uh, or the uh, the Persian Wars, uh, or you know, uh, it doesn't make sense to to study Roman military history if you don't know anything about I don't know Renaissance warfare. Doesn't make any freaking sense. So I think I suggest if you are interested in military history to read as much as you can about everything, not to stop because I realize that that most of the interest towards history today. That is definitely positive as a general interest for history, but it's it's negative um, to see, in my opinion, that most of the interest towards history is ideological. If people do not click on these videos because they care about history in the first place, but because they have some kind of ideological um, thrill about, I don't know, they get hyped at seeing, I don't know, the Roman legions, and they they don't even know what the Middle Ages has been. It, it, 
and that means that you don't know anything about the Roman legions as well and this might sound paradoxical but it isn't I can assure you and maybe I will make a video now because this was a video on the Assyrians and I'm starting to talk about these things for no reason so I'll cut it all cut it short now um, but that's uh, a point if you if you're interested so for now excuse me if really the beginning of the video wasn't that thrilling um, but anyhow um, I thank you um, naturally for the attention I hope you enjoyed this video and if uh, you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel for receiving if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now thank you again heartily for listening to me I wish you, I wish you a nice time I wish <laughs> I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.